students. So, we meet again. Once again, we have a lecture on stress distribution in soils. This is the fourth in the series. We have covered three lectures already and apart from seeing what is the importance of stress distribution in soil mechanics, we have also got started with the computation of stress distribution using the method of theory of elasticity. It is worth recapitulating that theory of elasticity is based on certain very basic assumptions such as the medium is homogeneous, isotropic and elastic and a continuum. We also assume or we ensure rather that any typical adjacent elements in the medium when they undergo deformation, they undergo this deformation in a compatible way. So, taking together the equilibrium equations, the relationships between strains and displacements, the stress strain elastic relationships and the compatibility conditions. We found that in all there are 15 equations and 15 unknowns and they can be solved to get what is known as a Laplace's equation. This equation can be solved with the help of the so called airy stress approach. The airy stress function is a function which is a function of position that means, it is a function of the coordinates x y z of the medium which means that it gives the distribution of the stresses, the overall pattern of distribution of the stresses in the medium both with respect to x y the horizontal direction and also with respect to the z direction. This stress function is a function which when let us say suitably differentiated will give you the stress components sigma x, sigma y and sigma z at any point at which we desire to get the stresses. That is precisely what Businesk had done. He evolved a stress function, the credit goes to him for evolving that stress function phi which is applicable to a three dimensional problem of stress distribution subject in a medium subjected to a concentrated load on the surface. Let us take a quick look at a few slides to recapitulate all this whatever we had discussed in the last few classes. So, in the last lecture we continued with the theory of elasticity, saw how theory of elasticity has been used by Businesk and how Businesk has evolved his own approach based on theory of elasticity and we also saw how to use Businesk's approach to determine stress distribution due to 1 a point load and 2 a line load. Why did we choose a point load and a line load? A point load is the simplest form of loading one can imagine a concentrated load at a point in a medium. See for example, if this is the medium at any point there can be a load. This is a point load or a concentrated load. This is known as a point load or a concentrated load. So, we have a method to determine stress at any point P or say A due to this concentrated load. In other words, if we have a number of concentrated loads and if we assume superposition to be valid, then we can find out at this point A the stress due to each one of these concentrated loads which means in effect a line load. After all a line load is nothing but a load consisting of a number of concentrated loads along a single line. So, if we get the solution for one concentrated load it means that we can get the solutions for every concentrated load acting at every point along a line and all these when summed up or in other words when it is integrated over a finite length we get the stress at the point A. These two are fundamental and very basic 
with the help of this concentrated and line load and the method for stress distribution determination due to these two loads, we will be able to solve any problem. Suppose, we have a rectangular area which has got a uniformly distributed load knowing the distribution due to a concentrated load or a line load, we can extrapolate it to a number of lines and cover the entire area. So, the stress distribution due to a uniformly distributed load over a large area can be calculated. If the area is circular, all that will happen is the pattern of summing up the effect that is integrating will change, but the basic principle concept the approach will still remain the same. So, once we know the stress distribution procedure for concentrated load and hence the line load we can apply it to any area and there are of course, methods available to also tackle arbitrarily shaped areas. We shall be now proceeding further to see once again very quickly the equations and the method of computation of stresses under point loads and line loads. In this lecture, we shall quickly take a look at the calculation of stresses due to a concentrated and line load as I said just now and then continue with application of those to a strip load, to a rectangular area and 3 a circular area. These as you can see or visualize represent 3 very typical cases in practice. Imagine as I have said a few times in the earlier lectures as well a long compound wall. This has got a foundation and under this foundation there is going to be stresses induced due to the compound wall and this can very well be taken as a small strip because it has got a very large length compared to the small dimensions in the cross sectional direction and this can very well be considered as a strip. So, this is nothing but what is known as a strip load. On the other hand, if we have a regular foundation under a column and if we consider the load being distributed under this foundation, then the area of this foundation, the base area of the foundation acts as a rectangular area over which there is an uniformly distributed load where B is the width of this foundation and L is the length of the foundation, it could be square. If it is circular of diameter say D, then again this principle can be applied and we can study the stress distribution below a circular load as well and that is what we are going to see today. We shall be taking a strip load, extending it to a rectangular area and then we shall also see how to compute stresses below a circular area. Now, a word about this superposition which I mentioned briefly. See, if we have two loads, the effect of one load and the effect of the other load can be determined separately and they can be added together to get the effect of the total load and this is known as the principle of superposition. Let me just briefly explain why this is important and how this can be justified. Let us take the stress strain relationship for the soil below the foundation. Let us say it is linear and in fact, if you look deep into the method that we have used, you will find that we have assumed the elastic properties E and nu to be constants, which means that this modulus E is a constant or it implies that the stress strain relationship is linear, sigma E relationship is linear. Now, if this is linear then this theory of elasticity that we have used is called generally as linear elasticity theory. Now, when we employ this theory of linear elasticity then and only then the principle of superposition is valid. Imagine we are applying a load or a and a corresponding stress say which we can call as P 1. This stress P 1 is going to produce a strain let us say that is E epsilon 1. Now, suppose I apply an additional stress of delta P that is going to produce an additional strain say delta epsilon. This means that 
the total stress applied is P 1 plus delta P say P 2 and the total strain is epsilon 1 plus delta epsilon say epsilon 2. Now, imagine that we are applying straight away the load P 2 then this load P 2 according to the linear theory of elasticity is going to have a strain epsilon 2 which is going to be exactly the same as this epsilon 2. This means that whether we apply P 1 and then an incremental stress delta P or whether we apply P 2 the final strain remains the same. This means that the principle of superposition is valid rather than determining the in rather in case we want to determine the stress due to a, a load P 2 which consists of two components P 1 and delta P. It is possible to calculate the effect of P 1 separately, effect of delta P separately and add and get exactly the same effect that P 2 would have created if it had been applied directly. This is the principle of superposition and very soon we shall see an example where this will be useful to us. Let us proceed further. Let me recapitulate, emphasize that we are dealing with an x y z coordinate system as shown here. This is z, this is x y and there is an arbitrary point p and an element surrounding that in the medium. The center of this parallel epiped or the element has got coordinates x y z. Next, we have already seen that due to a concentrated load P, the stress sigma z at any point inside the medium is going to be given by this expression. And in this expression, if we take out P by z square, we can write the stress sigma z in, two, in terms of a factor called the influence factor, which incidentally is equal to this. Now, these three expressions are valid for a concentrated load and therefore, for stress at any point due to a concentrated load P, the influence factor is this. Next, these are the influence factors derived by substituting different values of R upon Z in the expression for sigma Z shown in the previous slide. So, a series of influence factors can be obtained for a range of R by Z varying from 0 to 2.9 and therefore, if you know in any given problem where the point at which you want the stress is lying. That means, if you know the coordinates r and z, you can calculate i f. i f multiplied by p by z square will give you the sigma z, which we had seen in the earlier lecture and let us take a quick look at the example, which we saw last time once again. Determine the vertical stress on a horizontal plane at a depth of 12 meters due to a concentrated load 800 kilo newtons in a, an elastic medium. So, the solution would be find out r by z. It so happens that if r by z is 0, i f is 47745. This is happening because the we want the stress on the surface where z is equal to 0. Then the influence coefficient is this. Therefore, the stress sigma z is this influence coefficient into p divided by z square and that is 2.653 kilo Newton per meter square. Okay. Now, if we have a line load, the effect of the concentrated load can be summed up over this entire length and the effect of the line load at the point in the parallel epiped can be computed. The expression for sigma z will then be this and if we want to determine the stress due to a line load of magnitude small p equal to 400 kilo Newton per meter, where small p is the intensity of loading along the line. Then for an x of 5 meters and z of 5 meters, we can compute the sigma z value as 12.73 kilo Newtons per meter square. Now, comes the importance of the use of sigma z computation by the principle of superposition. Take for example, two concentrated loads P 1 and P 2 and any point A in the medium P 1 is 400 kilo Newton per meter. This is a line load actually 
400 kilo Newton per meter in a direction like this and P 2 1000 kilo Newton per meter again a line load along this. So, we will compute the stress compute stress due to two line loads at a point A which is at a distance of 10 meters horizontally from the load P 1 and 5 meters horizontally from the load P 2 and at a depth of 5 meters. Proceeding further what we will do is we will compute the stress due to each load separately and apply the principle of superposition. Okay. Suppose we take the first load the first load is P 1 we know its magnitude we know the magnitude in the sense the intensity of loading we know the point A its coordinates and therefore, we can use the formula which we saw two slides earlier for computing sigma z due to a line load at any depth and the corresponding influence factor. We can find if we apply that principle that the stress due to P 1 in this slide is sigma z due to P 1 at the point A will be this. If I substitute the value of P 1 which is 400 kilo Newton per meter and if I substitute the values of z and x where z is 5 meters and x is 10 meters I will find that sigma z due to p 1 is 2.037 kilo Newton per meter square. Take now for example, the second load if the second load is 1000 kilo Newton per meter and if the point A with respect to this load is at 5 meters horizontally and 5 meters deep then the stress due to P 2 sigma z P 2 will be given by a similar formula where now we will have the load P 2 and the coordinates x and z equal to 5 and 5 respectively. This when you substitute you get the stress due to the second load as 31.835 kilo Newton per meter square. Now, since principle of superposition is justifiable because of the approach being a linear theory of elasticity approach we can get the total stress as the sum of these two stresses which is equal to the stress sigma z at the point A and that is 33.872 kilo Newton per meter square. Okay. Now, we come to subject matter of today's lecture which requires the knowledge of the previous lecture and that is the reason why we went through recapitulating what we we discussed in the last class. Now, we shall see how to compute the stress below a strip load. Let us take a look at this slide. The strip load here is defined by a width b and a very long length. The length is very large and that is why no specific length is mentioned here. For all practical purposes it can be taken as a infinitely long compared to b. And now if you want the stress due to this load at point p then we can proceed using the line load formula. Suppose this is the load we take a cross section along the load then at this is the point p then suppose this is the load distributed over a length b capital B as we saw in the previous diagram. In order to compute the effect of this stress at point p what we shall do is to take a very small element d r at a distance r find out its effect and the stress due to it at the point p and then integrate it over the width capital B. So, suppose this is the z axis taken at the center then this r is the distance at which the element d r lies due to symmetry we can do the summing up or the integration of the stress at p over the length minus b by 2 to plus p by 2. Actually this is amounting to applying the principle of superposition repeatedly for every point load that is acting over this length capital B. There lies the importance of the principle of superposition and the knowledge of what is the stress due to a point load. See this if you add all the stresses due to each one of these then you get the vertical stress at the point P due to 
the entire load. Suppose we derive an expression for the stress due to the small element and we call the stress as d sigma z, then the stress due to the small element at the point capital P will be given by this. It is possible to derive this based on Businesk's theory. Now, by integrating this d z from minus b by 2 to plus b by 2, we will get the stress sigma z at the point b, p and it will turn out to be sigma z equal to small p by pi into beta plus sin beta cos beta plus 2 delta, where these angles beta and delta are shown in the previous diagram. Let us take a look at it again. This is the angle beta made by the point p with respect to the edges of the loaded area and delta is the angle made with respect to the vertical by the line joining the nearest end of the loaded area. So, knowing beta delta it will be possible to find out sigma z at p. Suppose we find sigma z at p like this then by dividing this value by the unit load small p per unit length we get what is known as the stress concentration. This stress concentration can be represented as 1 upon pi this. This means that for any applied load small p it is possible to find out the stress corresponding stress sigma z using this formula and for this purpose we can derive a table which gives sigma z by p as a function of x non dimensionalized and z non dimensionalized. The stress sigma z is also non dimensionalized the distances x and z the coordinates or the lengths x and z are also non dimensionalized. This non dimensionalization is with respect to the width of loading that is capital B. Now, this table gives you the sigma z by p values you can see that these values range from 0 here in this range as we go further away and as we go deeper they gradually decrease. So, from this it is possible to calculate the stress at any point laterally as well as with respect to depth due to a strip load. Now, having understood how the stress is computed due to a strip load let us take an example the data that is required for computing stresses due to a strip load are the width of the strip, the load per unit area, the coordinate system, the x coordinate and the z coordinate of the point at which we want the stresses and that is precisely what we have in this example. Determine the vertical stress on a horizontal plane at a depth of 6 meters at a point distant 6 meters from the center line and the strip itself is subjected to 800 kilo Newton per meter square and the width of the strip is 6 meters. Let us take the stress per unit length that is small p. In our case it is 800 kilo Newton per meter square. Next the width of the strip which is loaded is 6 meters which means that b by 2 the factor which is half the width which is used for non dimensionalization will be 3. Now, the coordinates of the point at which we want the stresses are x and z that means we want the stresses on a horizontal plane at a depth of 6 meters at a point which is also at 6 meters from the center line. This can be found out by first working out the non dimensionalized coordinates that is x divided by b by 2 and z divided by b by 2 which as you will see are also respectively 2 and 2. This means that sigma z by p can be computed from the table which we had in the previous slide. Let us see what value of sigma z by p we get for an x equal to 2 and a z upon b by 2 equal to 2 that is the non dimensionalized coordinates are 2 each. Let us go back to the previous slide see here at a value of x upon b by 2 equal to 2 and z upon b by 2 equal to 2 we find that 
sigma z upon p is 0 0.1847 that is the stress concentration. So, going back to our calculation sigma z by p is 0 0.1847. However, the load actually applied is 800 kilo Newton per meter square. This means that the stress that will arise will be merely this multiplied by the applied stress p that means 0 0.1847 into 800 which will turn out to be 147.76 kilo Newtons per meter square. This is all about strip. Once we have the load per unit area it will be possible to calculate the stress at any point. With the help of this we can calculate the stress on an entire horizontal plane. We can calculate the stress on a vertical plane below the center of the strip away from the strip and thus we will be able to very easily get the stress distribution on a horizontal plane. How the stress varies from the loaded area as we go away or as we go below. In other words with just one expression by applying it repeatedly to different points it is possible to get the entire pattern of distribution of stresses below the foundation or below the loaded area at any depth at or at any point away from the loaded area including points outside the loaded area. This can be now extended to rectangular areas. Let us see how this slide shows a typical rectangular area. This is the x coordinate, this is the y coordinate, this is the rectangular loaded area. The dimensions of the loaded area are L and B, L in the direction x and B in the direction y. In order to compute the stress due to this loaded area at any point at depth, we assume uniform distribution of the load above. All these yellow lines indicate a uniformly distributed load over the entire rectangular area. Well, there are two approaches to this problem now. We can divide the rectangular area into a number of strips and apply the concept of loading on a strip and sum them up or alternately which will amount to the same thing. We can once again proceed from fundamentals take a small area find out the stress due to this loading over the small area at the point A or P where we want the stresses and then integrate it over the length L and the length B. This latter one this approach is what has been preferred and expressions have been derived already very well known expressions are already available based on theory of elasticity to compute the stress at any point A due to uniformly distributed load over this entire area. The result will be the same whether we compute the stress due to various strips and add them or we compute stress due to any one element and sum it up over length and breadth L and B. And you can imagine that it has to be the same because after all everywhere basically we are applying the principle of superposition repeatedly for point loads or concentrated loads acting at every point on the loaded area. So, the final result will be given by the same expression and in this case the expression will be due to an elemental area the stress is this where small p is the load per unit area applied load per unit area d x d y are the dimensions of the small elemental loaded area where d x is the dimension in the x direction and d y is the dimension in the y direction. Z is the depth at which we desire to have the stress x and y are the other coordinates. Now, as I said the approach that we shall be preferring is one in which this elemental stress d sigma z at the point p is integrated over the length and the breadth. So, this is integrated over b and integrated over l this expression and finally, the resulting expression is expressed in terms of this the applied load per unit area p into a factor called the influence factor. This influence factor is represented as i m n where m is nothing but a ratio of the width b divided by a 2 
with respect to the depth z and n is the ratio of the length l and the depth z. Once again non dimensionalization this influence factor by definition as we had seen in the earlier case also is nothing but the stress that is arising due to applied load unit applied load. So, if the influence factor is multiplied by the actual applied load we get the stress due to the applied load p and this influence factor is called as i m n because we are now dealing with influence factor over an area or for stresses over a rectangular area. Since the rectangular area has two dimensions which are unequal the corresponding non dimensionalized dimensions at every depth z will also be 2 in number m and n and therefore, influence coefficient will depend upon the value of m and the value of n and therefore, it is denoted as i m n and it will vary as m and n vary. If we plot that expression p i m n whatever expression we have derived p i m n in this suppose we take p as unit load we take the influence coefficient i m n calculate it for several dimensions l and b of typical rectangular areas then we get a complete range of influence coefficients and a graph with the help of which rather than computing every time the influence coefficient we can merely measure it off from the graph. See for example, previous slide once again see this previous slide indicates that this influence coefficient i m n is nothing but integration with small p which is a constant taken outside. That means, the influence factor i m n is nothing but the double integral of 3 into z cube d x d y by 2 pi into this. This entire integration operation can be considerably simplified can be used repeatedly if we can develop non dimensional charts in advance and that is what we are having in the next slide. In this slide we are having non dimensionalized charts which will give the influence factors for different values of dimensions of the loaded area and depth. Suppose, the longitudinal dimension is expressed as m times the depth where z is the depth and the dimension in the lateral direction is n into z. Then if you look at this graph we have m along the x axis we have the influence factors along the y axis and all these yellow lines here they are all plotted for different values of n. So, if I know m and if I know n I can read off from this graph the corresponding influence factor and the influence factor multiplied by the applied load per unit area small p will give you the stress at this point A. Now, we have several points under this loaded area all of them at the depth say z then for which point shall we compute the influence factors. It is found convenient to develop influence factor charts for a point such as A below the corner of the loaded area and that is precisely what is used to compute stress below any point below the loaded area. If we know the stress at any point below the corner it is found that it can be used again and again to compute the stress at any other point below the loaded area. Let us see how take this loaded area x y this is the loaded area x y this loaded area x y is like this where this length is l this length is b. Then suppose I want the stress at a point A below this corner I can directly use the influence coefficients chart which we saw in the previous slide because they have been derived specifically for computing stress below a corner. Now, if I want the stress below let us say any other point 
such as B, it is easy to visualize that the stress at this point B is going to be the stress due to an area like this, this area due to the remaining area here this and also due to this and finally, this. In other words, I have divided this into four smaller areas 1, 2, 3 and 4 as shown in this slide here. Once I divide the given area into four parts 1, 2, 3 and 4. In this diagram they are shown as equal areas, but in general they need not be equal either. Once I divide the area into four parts, then suppose this is the point below which I want the stresses say that is at point B. Then B happens to be at the corner of area 1 of the corner at the corner of area 2 and also similarly at the corner of area 3 and area 4. It is just that it is at a different corner of each one of these loaded areas. So, if I want the stress at this corner of area 1, I shall appropriately choose m and n. See for example, the previous slide once again you find here by definition in this sketch if the point A is below this corner then this dimension is m this dimension is n. If we apply that concept to area 1 here then this dimension is going to be the dimension m z and this direction is going to be the dimension n z. If I extend this to area 2, area 2 happens to be identical to the definition sketch in the slide and that means, this dimension is going to be m z and this dimension is going to be n z. We can extrapolate this, we can apply this same concept or same no principle to the other two areas and compute the stress repeatedly due to each one of these rectangular areas at one of their corners. And then we have been using theory of linear elasticity and therefore, the principle of superposition is going to be valid. All that we need to do now is having calculated the stress at point B due to each one of these loaded areas, we simply sum them up to get the stress at B due to the entire loaded area. It so happens that we have assumed uniform loading over the entire area. But suppose the loading also varies, we can apply different loading intensities to each one of these rectangular areas. But we must remember that within any one rectangle, the intensity of loading has to remain same, because the formulae that we are applying are all meant for uniform loading. That means, now for this area 1, the intensity could be different in principle from the intensity in this area P 2, this is P 1. However, it does not affect the method of computation, the method of computation remains same, it is just that we shall be having different intensities to deal with in each one of these loaded areas and the influence factor multiplied by the corresponding intensity of loading will give us the stresses at the point B. So, this diagram which we have already seen tells us the principle behind computation of stress at any point beneath the loaded area based on the stress computed at one of the corners of the any one of these loaded areas. Now, comes the extension of this principle to circular areas. It is not uncommon to find circular foundations. Where do we find circular foundations? Where we have pillars which are circular in shape, 
it is good to have circular foundations. We have bridges, we have even buildings or structures which all have you know let us say possibility of having a circular shape. A water tank for example, could be circular in shape, it will have a few columns and it is possible to use circular foundations for these columns. And these circular foundations will also be amenable to computation of stresses by the same principles that we have been using all this time. For example, what we have been doing all this while was whenever we wanted to compute stresses beneath an area, we took an elemental area. Within that small elemental area, the applied load intensity is constant and by using the concept of stress beneath a very small loaded area, which is as good as a point load. We now take the expression for that loaded area and integrate it over the dimensions of the loaded area. So, we now can do similar, can do the say, same thing with a circular area as well. Look at this circular area, it has got a radius capital R, it has an uniformly distributed load again denoted by small p in kilo newtons per meter square let us say and we want the stress at any point A. This point A in general could be anywhere beneath the loaded area, but in this particular diagram I have chosen the point directly beneath the center. This is the radius capital R. In order to find out the stress due to this loaded area, we take a small elemental area here at an angle or rather at a distance small r with a width d r and having a length given by r d theta. This area will impose a stress over the point A, which will be given by an expression shown in the next slide. The expression for stress beneath a loaded area, beneath its center is given in the form of the influence factor sigma z by p equal to i f equal to 1 upon r by z whole square plus 1 raised to the power of 3 by 2. This means that once again we have non dimensionalized the stress, we have non dimensionalized the lengths in this case the radius and therefore, we have an expression which is general which can be used for all circular loaded areas and it is possible to evolve obviously, charts so that we can avoid repeated computation of the stresses using this formula. See in the next slide, this is a graph which has been precisely derived from the in the manner in which I mentioned a while ago. Z upon r is plotted along the vertical dimension, vertical axis and the non dimensional stress sigma z by p is plotted along the horizontal axis. And this is therefore, a non dimensional plot of vertical stress or vertical stress concentration with respect to non dimensional depth z upon r. And this has been computed specifically for a point below the center of the uniformly loaded circular area. It can be extrapolated also to points away from the center and even away from the loaded areas in a manner similar to what we had done for rectangular areas. Now, we are armed with if you take stock of what we have done, we are now armed with methods for computing stresses beneath a point load which is extrapolated to a line load which is then extrapolated to a strip load which is then generalized for a rectangular area or for a circular area. This means that almost all regular shapes have been now taken care of. Wherever we have regularly shaped foundations, it is possible to apply this simple concept of theory of elasticity 
and repeatedly apply the principle of superposition of stresses due to a number of point loads and cover the entire area. And in each case we have simplified the process of repeated computation by taking a small element and integrating over the area. And not only that we have further simplified the process of computing the influence factor by developing non dimensional charts in which the influence factor can be merely read off by knowing non dimensional lengths and widths of the loaded area, non dimensional depth or non dimensional diameter or non dimensional radius in the case of a circular loaded area. So, this in sum and substance is the theory of elasticity approach which is used for computing stresses below loaded areas. We have of course, used the assumption that the load intensity is uniform. However, it is also possible to compute stresses for non-uniform loading intensities. All that is required is to divide our given area into areas of uniform loading into a number of areas of different uniform loading intensities. Apply the principle that we have seen repeatedly each one of these sub areas apply the principle of superposition and get the total stress. So, what we have done is in this lecture to summarize we have seen the stress distribution beneath the strip load beneath the rectangular area and beneath the circular area. And as I said we will be in a position to now generalize all this and extrapolate it to more generalized instances. For example, in the next lecture we will see how exactly to use these concepts which we have developed the influence charts which we have seen in order to compute stresses below a rectangular area. We will see a number of examples of different types of loadings or different types of loading intensities uniform and non-uniform of examples of computing stresses beneath or at points which need not necessarily be located below the corners of the rectangular area. We will extrapolate all those methods to circular areas and then finally, we will see how best we can calculate the stress beneath an area of any arbitrary shape. We will see as I said a number of numerical examples as well in order to reinforce the understanding of the methods that we have used. So, with this I conclude today's lecture. I have necessarily gone into detailed explanation of the procedure, I have gone into detailed explanation of the principle of superposition and the concept that has been used in the computation of the stresses beneath each one of these areas. This is basic to computation of the stresses in any generalized situation such as loading below an arbitrarily shaped area. And what is more in the next class we will not only be seeing a number of numerical examples, we will also be seeing a very generalized chart a graphical procedure which can be used for any shape circular rectangular or even arbitrary shape. Now, the understanding that we have developed in today's lecture is very essential to understand how the chart has been developed. In fact, that chart has been developed by a person by name Newmark, an engineer by name Newmark, whose name I have mentioned in one of the earlier lectures. So, with this I will conclude today's lecture. Thank you.